Good evening, everyone, for our Wednesday uh, prayer and Bible study. I hope, again, you would download the uh, prayer sheet and spend a good, you know, 10, 15 minutes with your family or whoever you're with to uh, pray together. Uh, that is an essential part of the church that God has ordained and uh, pray in particular for the uh, King County to go into phase two so we have the opportunity uh, to assemble together in some kind of form. Uh, it will not be uh, like uh, we used to, uh, but but we want to move forward with that, uh, uh, going through the precautions uh, that are necessary in order to accomplish that in this day in this age. And then, of course, also pray uh, for our uh, leaders and our law enforcement during this time of, of chaos. Again, we need to pray that God will have mercy. <clears throat> we are, uh, remember that seeing these things are, yes, in a sense, it will bring God's judgment for, uh, but, but, uh, for, for evil. But at the same time, it's also uh, a demonstration or evidence that God is already judging. And uh, that, that is part of what God does to allow sinful nature to express itself in freedom. God has is, is constantly uh, suppressing evil, whether those people are saved or lost. He is suppressing evil, and as people turn their hearts from God, that he allows that sinful nature uh, to express itself in greater ways, and that's part of what's happening. So we need to pray for wisdom and direction, but especially for God's mercy uh, upon our, our country uh, for its present uh, situation. So as, um, as we begin our Bible study tonight, let's, let's go ahead and jump over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. That'll be our main text tonight. So I'll give you a moment there or just pause it for a second as you turn there to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And I want to continue the thought we started last Wednesday on God's sovereignty over evil. So God is sovereign. And we, we started there with uh, Genesis chapter 50 and saw Joseph in his, his uh, speech to his brothers after the death of Jacob. And so remember his words uh, that we're, we're focusing on in Genesis 50 and verse 20. It says, as, as Joseph is talking, But as for you, ye thought or meant evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. So let's go ahead and pray and ask for God's blessing on our study of his word here tonight. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for its instruction. Thank you for its inspiration, both in the sense of our present day of encouraging us uh, and to um, help us to move forward in faith, but also thank you for uh, it's inspiration in the sense of breathed out by God. It's your very word. And we thank you for that. Thank you that your spirit takes it and, and we hear your voice through its written revelation and uh, that applies to our daily life. And so, Father, I pray you'd apply this to our lives here tonight. Uh, help us understand your truth and uh, really, Lord, to get an understanding of you and your power and your sovereignty and what that means for us on a daily basis. Thank you again for that truth in Jesus' name. Amen. So as Joseph made this, he said that God had a clear purpose for what uh, he allowed uh, Joseph's brothers to, to bring about. So God planned it for good. So, so God is sovereign, and he made the evil plans of Joseph's brothers to fit right into his uh, plans for Joseph. And so those were not diametrically opposed things. God is sovereign, so they fit together in perfect, like a puzzle piece. It just, it fits. And, and so we've looking at that. And so that's what Joseph believed about God's sovereignty, even over the evil plans 
of his brothers. God meant it unto good. That's why Joseph had no bitterness. That's why Joseph had no, no revenge. So this concept that Joseph had, you see how practically how practical it is for believers today. He believed the power of Almighty God works on behalf of those who love him to bring forth good even through the evils that come into a life. Romans 8:28 is still true. We 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 know that all we know, we've got to know this, that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So of course you've got to be um uh you know saved and you got to be loving God uh for that to happen, but it does happen and you need to believe that that it's a truth that God wants you to understand and to live by. So two truths to help you see God's good purpose in life, even in times of evil. And the first thing we looked at last week was like what I call a theological balance. And three thoughts are that God is always good. Uh, Psalm 119, 68, thou art good and doest good. So yes, there's evil in this world. And the entrance of evil came when Adam sinned against God, when he did not obey what God told him to do. And that that evil continues to this very day by each generation making those evil decisions. But God is always good and does good, always. So that's the first point. God is always good. The second thing, evil is always evil. Wickedness, it, it does not change into goodness even when God makes it work out for good. Evil is always evil even though God is is bringing it for the good of his people and for the glory of his name. I thought about, you remember when Paul and Silas went to Philippi and they, they were preaching Christ and they were preaching against the idols. And, and all of a sudden, this mob came up and, and grabbed them and, and brought them to the, the magistrates, the, the leaders there. And those magistrates made a decision on the spot and said that, um, that that Paul and Silas were evil and they had them beaten and they put them into the inner prison and put their, their feet in stocks and, and they could not move. And what a horrible thing. So none of that was fair. None of that was legal. And, and uh, you know, so we could say it was, it was evil, both on the side of the mob and the side of the, of the leaders. All of that was, was contrary to, to moral and, and ethical uh, truth. It was, it was evil. And yet God worked it out for the good of, of Paul and Silas. They were, they were publicly apologized to and they were released. And then we know it was for God's glory, for the Philippian jailer got saved. What a, what a marvelous thing. So even in this happy ending, you could say, and this eternal salvation that came, the, the evil deeds of those men were still evil. They were wicked, and God, uh, and that comes to our third point. So God is always good. Evil is always evil, even when good comes about. And the third thing is humanity is always accountable. And, and we looked at several verses for that, uh, but we'll not, we'll not turn to those. But uh, no matter how much good comes out of it, uh, and no matter how it fits into God's ultimate purpose or good plan, God will hold each person accountable for each evil deed they have done. Unless, of course, they trust Christ and it's forgiven. Uh, though, as a Christian, we'll still be held accountable at the judgment seat of Christ. But there's no escape uh, from, from being accounted uh, uh, being accountable to God for, for the deeds we do, both good and evil. But obviously here we're focusing on that evil. So God's always good. Evil is always evil. And, and humanity is always held accountable for the evil that they do. So that's the theological balance we want to see and understand. Uh, and then the second thing, what I'm going to call the good purposes uh, uh, of God. So the theological balance and then the good purposes. Uh, like Joseph, we must always trust in the wisdom and power to God and power of God and that God is so sovereign that he moderates, uh, uh, I guess you could say moderates, uh, uh, the, the evil that is done in this world so it fits perfectly in with his, his, the good that he intends it to do. And so all things serve to advance God's cause in this created universe. And so some questions come up along that line, okay? Um, what are those good causes? 
What are those good purposes? What, what purpose could God have in allowing evil to continue in this world? If God is good and God is sovereign, why doesn't he just put a stop to evil? You know, why, why not? Why, why does God, what, you know, you think, what is God doing when evil touches my life? You know, what is, what is God up to when, when the bad, whether it's, whether it's bad in, in, through the creation, through circumstances, or bad by the evil decisions of people, why, why does God allow those to touch my life and touch your life as a child of God? Well, why does he do that? And so we'll eventually get to three good purposes God has in allowing evil to touch our life. But we'll just look at one tonight. So let's go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, <coughs> excuse me, and verse number 7. So 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. And, and we'll just, uh, let, let's just do this tonight. Let, I'll, I'll, I'll read a portion of it and then we'll comment. And so we'll sort of go through here. So the point is this, one of the good purposes, it, it can help you be more dependent on God. Okay, so, so why does God um, allow evil to touch your life? And the first one is it can help you be more dependent on God. As the apostle uh, God had given uh, Paul uh, special revelation uh, about, you know, really, really New Testament, the new, new covenant uh, obligations for his people and directions. So God had given this heavenly vision. And so in order to, to not allow pride to be a problem uh, for the apostle, because he had, you know, uh, different from anybody else, had these these visions and revelations from God. Notice what God did in verse 7. He says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. So, so new truth that God had given through the apostle to give to the churches so he wouldn't get proud about it. He said, There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Now, that thorn in the flesh, where, where it doesn't really, I think it's just general, so it has lots of applications. Uh, people say that it may have been some, some people who were opposing Paul in his ministry and maybe even being physically violent. We know that Paul did face that on a number of occasions. I, I think that could be one thing, uh, but I think it probably more, more likely was, was some kind of aspect of a physical problem, whether it was a, an injury or a disease or just an illness that had, had long-standing ramifications on him, uh, you know, whatever that happened to be, uh, that, that those, those things uh, had those lingering effects. And that was this, this thorn in the flesh. And the flesh there is, is, is his body, physically, somehow, maybe a combination of all of that, uh, and maybe others as well. But Paul said there was a thorn. Now, that's not just like you get a thorn in your finger, you know, a rose bush thorn, or maybe a sliver that, you know, does, does hurt, you know, especially if it goes under your fingernail or something. I mean, there's, there's pain in that. But this, this seems to point to something a little bigger. Uh, this seems to point to, a, to like a stake or um, not a stake you eat, but a stake you put into the ground, uh, some kind of sharpened stick. And it would seem to be something more that would impale someone, something like a spear, but, but not so much along that line, but it would be something that would pierce into the, 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 the skin or the flesh. And so obviously that's far from being comfortable. You, you would not be, oh, I, got, I just got impaled. You know, I feel fine. No, it's not. You know, it's something that really, really hurts. It's not a calm. And so these, these lingering problems uh, of, of prolonged difficulty uh, is, is part of the curse of sin. And it had, had, had struck the Apostle Paul. Uh, some kind of physical difficult, physical ailment, physical handicap. Uh, that had hit him, and and I think it, his his main goal was was it's hindering ministry, Lord, and so he was he was struggling with that. So this thorn in the flesh in his physical something was was really hindering and hurting him. And then he second of all, notice he calls it says a uh, thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. And so here is the sort of the spiritual dynamic of the of the same. Uh, incident, the same situation, 
And and so it was, think about it, a messenger of Satan, sort of like a satanic or demonic ambassador that creates havoc and, and adversity, or, ad, you know, that, that it, for the apostle. You know, Satan means the adversary. And so there was some adverse situation. He said to buffet me. That buffet means to strike with the fist, to punch someone. It's a, it's a violent action, but it also can include violent words. And so both of those. So is, is there anything good about the devil and his message? No, okay? Is, is there any desire in the devil to promote God's will or to, to love the Lord or to please God? And the answer is no, 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 okay? So there's nothing good about this. But notice how he begins that phrase and right in the middle. He said, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh to the messenger of Satan, lest I should be exalted above measure. There was given to me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So, so Paul does not say who gave it to him, okay? But it does tell us the purpose lest I should be exalted above measure. In fact, remember, that's the way he started verse 7. Lest I should be exalted above measure for the abundance of the revelations in the end. Lest I should be exalted above measure. Lest I get proud. So if, if the, you know, you think about was the purpose for this thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, was the purpose of that, was it good or bad? Let me rephrase it. Is it is it better for a Christian to be humble or to be proud? So obviously we would say, well, it's better to be humble because the humble receive God's grace, and the proud, uh, you know, he he knows afar off. The proud uh, ha ha have uh, God deals with them. So whether it's natural affliction, when I say natural, you know, maybe the physical illness or something along that line. Uh, or, or, or satanic opposition. Those are the evils of a fallen world, okay? But they also fit into God's sovereign work for good for the Apostle Paul. Good that he not be proud. Good that he be humble. So uh, it does not... Now, now when that happens, when I say that he, he accepted that and saw that, that, that this was had a divine purpose, and therefore he could say, hey, there's, there's something that's good in this, that God is even using these evil things, this thorn in the flesh, this messenger of Satan um, that, that buffets me in this, this impalement. Um, he didn't sit around and just accept, oh, well, this is, must be God, so therefore I will just accept it. Um, this this evil this painful situation uh, I'll I'll just accept it no God God's people are to fight against evil we are to make this world uh, in in a sense a better place because we're here and first and foremost that is a spiritually better place because we're influencing people we're promoting the will of God we're sharing the gospel. And so when it comes to a personal level of that Paul mentions here of that influence and fight against evil, how do we do that? Well, what he did, he prayed. So verse number eight says, for this thing, for this difficulty, for this impalement, for this buffeting of the devil and his messenger and the message that he wants to give me, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And so Paul earnestly prayed that this thing that was hindering his ministry, at least he felt was hindering his ministry, he said, Lord, take it away. And from the apostles' prayer life that we have glimpses of in, in the, uh, the book of Acts and in, in many of his epistles, I would say this was, my personal opinion, this was three seasons of prayer and not just, you know, uh, one-minute prayer uh, of uh, three times in a row. I, th I didn't think it was just that. I, I think it was sessions of prayer. And it may have been like the Lord Jesus in the garden. I think some people say there's a parallel there. And, you know, Jesus, when he went to pray, was away for an hour before he came back and to see the three apostles that were with him. So I, I just think it was it was really an earnest prayer. And he, he knew that God's sovereign power could remove these evils, this painful time, this opposition. He, he believed. And, and so he, he asked for the evil 
which is evidence of the curse upon this world, both the demonic activity and evil actions of people or evil illnesses and, and, and such like. He asked God, would you please remove that? But God's answer in verse 9 is a definitive no, but, but praise God, there's an explanation to it, okay? And in this explanation, God provides for something. Here is the lesson that we're talking about here, that uh, those times that evil is allowed to touch your life, it's so you might learn to be more dependent on God. So, so notice, he says, why does evil, why is evil allowed to hit his children? When that happens, we need to hear and, and, and learn this truth. God says, my grace is sufficient for you. There is enough grace coming from God at any and every moment to sustain his people when they're hit by the evils of this world. We need to understand that. Look at back there in chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians in verse number, number 8. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse number 8. It says there, and God is able to make all grace. Think about this. God is able. God is powerful enough to make all grace abound toward ye, you, that ye having all sufficiency in all things may abound unto every good work. So, so we need we need to believe that that God is able. God is powerful enough to make all grace abound. So God says, my grace is sufficient for you. That's a truth. And then he and then he explains that a little more. For and I think this is the parallel statement, but it also explains that. What is grace? Grace is God's strength. My strength is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. So this explains God's grace. It provides strength for you at that moment, for that event, for that circumstance and situation, no matter how long it may continue. And, and the word strength there is, is the word dunamis. It is God's power, God's ability. It, God says, I want to give you my ability in your life so you can get through this situation when evil touches you. And then how does that come? He says that it comes to its perfect fullness. Okay, my strength is made perfect to its, its fulfilled end, to where God's heading it, directing it, when you recognize your weakness. Wow, that's, that's a statement that we all need to get. If you really want to see the fullness of God's power at work in you and through you, then God says you must come to the end of yourself and see how weak you are to overcome evil that is in you, to overcome evil that, that is around you, to overcome that evil, that tragedy, that pain, that suffering in a sin-cursed world that's that's filled with sinful people who do sinful things and not just to themselves but to others and to a society how, how are we going to fight that well god says you know what i allow those things to touch your life so you can come to the conclusion of your weakness to make a difference and so paul's conclusion in verse number how his response is most gladly, therefore, so therefore, I, I, will, I will be glad, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, and that's the same word, weaknesses, that he just, just mentioned that, that God said made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my weaknesses, that the power or the strength, same word is used up there in verse earlier in the verse, that strength, that power, that dunamis, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That was Paul's greatest need if he was going to accomplish God's will. That's your greatest need if you're going to accomplish God's will, which is your ultimate goal in life. In fact, that was probably Paul's desire. He was no masochist. He said, I don't, I don't love, I don't find joy in pain and in sorrow and in suffering. But when Jesus says, my strength is made perfect in this weakness, that's, that's good. God says, I, I, Paul says, I want to know God's power. And so he says, I know God's working this out for good. Therefore, I find joy in it. And that needs to be true of us. I want, I want to read something that I just wrote down as I was meditating, thinking about this. When some type of evil impales your flesh, okay? So we're talking about your physicality. 
okay, in your life. Something there is, is so troubling to your earthly life that you, you wonder if you can even make it, okay? When satanic opposition adds to the pain emotionally and mentally and spiritually, so that we we think about the messenger of Satan, and so the messenger often has a message, and 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 so he adds to that, or, you know, that that pain in the, the physical realm, and then it hits us mentally and emotionally and spiritually, and and he throws those fiery darts, so we open up ourselves to satanic counsel, and that counsel says, do what you have to do, just leave God out of the picture, just don't include him. That's always, he, he says, don't, you know, he, he'll tell you anything and everything except trust in God and, and follow and seek to fulfill his will. In those times when that happens, we must stop and listen to the Savior for he says, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my power can only be shown in its fullness when you, in your weakness, are desperately dependent upon me. That's when God shows his power. When you realize, boy, I, I, I can't do anything with this. I, I, I don't know where to turn. I'm not sure how to get about go about this. And so God says, hey, I'm trying to teach you. I allow evil to touch your life or touch your situation somehow so that you would stop and realize that my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect when you recognize your, your weakness. So then we come to verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in these things for that, that happen in, in infirmities and in approaches and in necessities and persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. And, and, and so Paul is says, when he says, I take pleasure, and he's saying, I I I there's there's I see good. Um and it seems good to me to look at these things with optimism. I'm, I'm looking at these terrible things in an optimistic way. Why? Because I'm certain that God Almighty and His wisdom and power and love is, is working good through all of this. I'm just going to trust Him. So, so think about it. None of these things are good, okay? No, they're, they're, they're evils. They're tragedies either come by nature or come through the evils of people or come through, through demonic, you know, uh, uh, confrontation or just all of that in life itself. They're all evil. In infirmities, that's my weaknesses. That's my lack of strength in my body because I have this thorn in the flesh. Or this lack of strength in my soul because I have a messenger of Satan that's buffeting that realm of my life. Or reproaches, that's that's verbal assault, that's a that's abuse verbally. Or in necessities, that's when all you have needs and those needs are not being met. It's 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 it's, it's like when you feel like everything's spinning around and you can't figure out which way to go and you're sort of dizzy about all the problem and you're just without answers. It's a necessities. In persecutions, obviously those are the times that, that stir up fears where you have to run and you have to flee when you're treated harshly for Christ's sake. So he said, that's, that's, none of these are good things. None of these that you look forward to, okay? Or in distresses, we would say that's just a stressful situation. The root of the word means you feel like everything's narrowing in on you and you have no good options to turn. It's, it's the proverbial between the rock and the hard place. That's what these distresses are. So he said all of those things, they come. And he says, I, I find, I, I take pleasure. I see that there's something good that God's going to work out. And it seems good to me when these things happen because when I see myself in my weakness, then am I strong. That's the long-term outlook. Paul said, I'm, I'm optimistic that God is using this time of all these evil events to make my, that, that make my life so difficult that God is using them to fulfill good uh, for his glory in my life. So remember, God is always good. Evil is always evil in the sight of, sight of God. But God's plan for your life, he will use the evil in this world to help you see your inability to accomplish God's will. Your weakness to fight the evil, your, your need to depend upon his grace, your need to be empowered by his spirit. You must see your weakness, though, for that to happen. I mean, really see it. 
So that when you bow your head and you pray and you're asking God for help, there's a, there's a desperate dependence upon God. And so we come to the end of this study this time. And so, yes, there's evil in this world and it hits God's people and it really hurts. And you need to pray that God would take away that evil. But then you must also see the bigger picture and be optimistic about those moments because it is part of God's sovereign plan. He will work it out for good to those who love him, to those who trust him. Remember Joseph's words. You thought evil against me or you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. God is controlling even those those evil times, whether by human or, divine, or, or demonic uh, means that God, they have an evil purpose. They have a will toward evil, but God meant it for good. And that is an encouraging thought. Be optimistic about whatever comes into your life because God and his love and his wisdom and his power is, is, is going to work it out for good. And one of those lessons we need to learn right up front is that God wants to teach you to depend upon his grace and upon his strength in those times of, of when evil may touch an aspect of your life. Is there something there, something for you to consider? To say, God, you're trying to teach me and I'm coming you with a new dependence. I hope you, hope, hope you would see that. I hope you see that God has a good purpose in allowing that evil to somehow be involved. That fallen aspect of, you, of, of, of this world, whether in humanity or in creation or even demonic activity. Uh, Lord, that, that he's going to work it out for good. And one of those is that you depend upon him in a greater way. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your truth. Thank you for your word that, that shows us, that reveals us, uh, the, the, the world around us, this fallen world, and how it impacts uh, the life of your people. And Father, I pray you'd help us to see that even when those things touch us, that you have a divine purpose in that, that you are you, you, you meant it unto good, and you are working it unto good, as we love you and seek to follow you. And so, Father, I pray you'd help us to see that in a new light and to be optimistic, no matter what may come our way, that you are working this out unto good for your people and unto your glory. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and may this truth be an encouragement to your heart.